Hi everyone, and today we're going to be looking at the branches of the abdominal aorta, and in particular the ones that are going to be uh, supplying the foregut organs. Now the uh, abdominal aorta supplies the digestive organs through a series of single vessels, and the first of those is the celiac trunk, second is the superior mesenteric artery, and the third is the inferior mesenteric artery. We're going to start off with the foregut, supplied by the celiac trunk, and we'll draw in the foregut organs here. Foregut organs are the distal esophagus, stomach, duodenum, or at least the proximal or first part of the duodenum, which is making a nice little C-shaped curve right there. Then other foregut organs include the spleen over here on the left side of the abdomen, and the liver which is mostly on the right side of the abdominal cavity, but its left lobe extends a bit to the left side of the abdomen as well. And the gallbladder hanging out on the underside of the liver. And I'll draw in a little cystic duct right there, just for kicks. And those are the foregut organs. So I'm gonna take a second here and fast forward real quickly to shade those in, make them a little more aesthetically pleasant. So my version of aesthetically pleasant may be radically different from yours, but I think that looks a little better. So the foregut organs receive their blood from the abdominal aorta, in particular through branches of what's called the celiac trunk. So we'll draw in the aorta coming into the cavity, and the aorta is retroperineal, meaning it's behind the perineal cavity. So it's technically posterior to all of these organs that it's supplying, and the branches that jump out enter the perineal cavity and run in a mesentery or a fold of the perineal lining from the body wall that allows it to reach the various organs. Now the celiac trunk supplying the foregut is probably the most complicated. The other two, superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric, are a little simpler. So here we'll draw in the celiac trunk nice big vessel coming right off the aorta anteriorly and the vessels that come off of it are also fairly large but for the sake of clarity I'm going to draw them as a line. Just realize these are of course vessels with a lumen and blood flowing through them. So celiac trunk is right here and it has three branches. The first jumps to the left and goes on to the lesser curvature of the stomach and supplies the lesser curvature in the surface of the stomach. This is the left gastric artery and it's got one important branch that jumps up onto the esophagus and travels a little bit superiorly. That's the esophageal branch of the left gastric artery. Now that's one branch down. The next one extends pretty much straight across, but because we've blown the organs all out of proportion here, these guys are usually much closer in, packed much tighter, we're going to draw it a little bit down. Just realize it normally jumps pretty much straight to the left on its way to the spleen and its posterior to the stomach. And one other organ we're going to draw in here in just a second. It has a nice little curly cued course as it gets to the spleen and ramifies into several vessels that move into the spleen right there. And no big surprise, this guy is the splenic artery. Now, one thing I neglected to mention is one other foregut organ sits right here in the bend of the duodenum. This is the head of the pancreas, and the t body and tail of the pancreas extend posterior to the stomach, and the tail almost makes it all the way to the spleen. So remember the pancreas is located posterior to the stomach which actually makes it very vulnerable to burst 
peptic ulcers or ulcers of the stomach lining that go through its posterior wall and can irritate and inflame the pancreas. And the reason we drew that in here is because the pancreas's body and tail receive vessels from the splenic artery that travel into its substance. And these guys, there's a great and several dorsal D goes that way. Pancreatic arteries. Double A for multiple arteries. Now one other thing happening with the splenic arteries, it sends a small branch up to this domed area of the stomach, the fundus, and those are called the short gastric arteries. Now once again, this is nowhere near as long as it appears on the schematic because these organs are much more tightly pressed together in the abdomen, but for the sake of clarity, I want you to be able to see the presumptive branching pattern there. All right, so now we're finished with the left gastric artery as well as the splenic artery, and we're moving on to the third branch, which, sad to say, is the most complicated of the three. From here, a branch goes towards the right side of the body gives off a branch that goes superiorly, and it gives off a branch that goes inferiorly. And this first branch is the common hepatic artery. And it's going to send out branches that go to the liver. One that's going to go to the left lobe, and another that's going to go to the right lobe, and also a branch comes off the right that goes to the gallbladder itself. And these guys go by the names. The one that's supplying all of those is the proper hepatic artery. This one, going to the left lobe, is the left hepatic artery, and no big feat of imagination to figure out that this guy is called the right hepatic, and most of the time, the blood supply of the gallbladder, the cystic artery, comes off the right hepatic. That's not universal, but that's the most common thing to happen, is have the cystic artery come off the right hepatic. <clears throat> Now, one other branch of this proper hepatic does something a little weird. It jumps off and heads down to the lesser curvature of the stomach and anastomoses with the left gastric artery. Again, I'm sure you've probably figured out the uh, common themes going on here, but this guy is the right gastric artery. So supplying the lesser curvature, we've got a left gastric and a right gastric. We'll see some other branches taking care of the rest of the stomach in just a minute. Now we've covered common hepatic branching into the proper hepatic and its sub-branches. Now we've got to deal with this guy. And this guy's name does a pretty good job of telling us what it's going to do. This is the gastro duodenal or duodenal artery. And it's going to go to the stomach and the duodenum. And it's got several branches. One branch jumps off and instead of going to the lesser curvature, travels to the greater curvature of the stomach, the big ballooned out area on the inferior surface of the stomach. And this goes by the pretty hefty name of the right gastro omental artery. And if there's a right gastro mental artery, there needs to be a left gastro mental artery. That's coming off our buddy, the splenic artery, which is located right nearby. So the greater curvature receives its blood supply from gastro omental arteries. Oops. 
So there's the left gastro-omental coming off the splenic. You'll also hear these referred to as gastroepiploic arteries. Omentum means apron in Latin, and epiploici means the same thing in Greek. So it depends which one you prefer, Latin or Greek, for whether you're going with omental or epiploic. Omental is a preferred nomenclature at the moment, but I'd say if you liked 300 better, go with the Greek, epiploikai. If you liked gladiator better, go with the Latin, omental. And it gets that apron, whether it's omentum or epiploikai, from the fact there's another organ dangling down from the inferior aspect of the stomach, and this is the greater omentum. And it forms an apron of peritoneal lining that covers the small intestines and extends off of the greater curvature of the stomach. So in the laboratory, if you're dissecting, lucky enough to be doing that, you'll see that very clearly hanging off the bottom of the stomach and connecting to the transverse colon underneath. But let's get back to branches of the gastroduodenal artery. First one we've got is the right gastroomental. Next, we have a little branch that jumps off and goes to the superior part of the duodenum. Nice intuitive name there. That is the supra duodenal artery. And this final branch heads down and runs along the duodenum and the head of the pancreas. And as it does so, it gives off an anterior branch. It goes on the anterior surface of the duodenum, right near the head of the pancreas, and supplies blood to both. And there's also a branch that goes posteriorly and does the same thing. Supplying the head of the pancreas and the duodenum. And this guy is named appropriately, but a little bit long-windedly. This is the superior pancreatico duodenal artery. And it has an anterior branch and a posterior branch. And some anatomy texts actually treat these as separate named arteries. So if you want to get in a tongue twister competition with your lab mates, you can go through the various branches, anterior, superior, pancreatico-duodenal, posterior, superior, pancreatico-duodenal, until you're blue in the face. Be my guest. Now, the good news is we've got all the branches of the celiac trunk accounted for now. Now, let's jump ahead just a little bit to the next section and talk about the next branch that comes off the abdominal aorta and supplies the midgut structures, the distal duodenum, the jejunum, ilium, cecum, appendix, transverse colon, and ascending colon. And this guy is the superior mesenteric artery. Another single branch that comes off of the aorta. Single branches supply the GI tract. Paired branches supply other organs that we'll talk about right near the end. Now the superior mesenteric artery I'm bringing up here because one of its early branches jumps retrograde and heads to the duodenum and the pancreas and it gives off an anterior branch and a posterior branch. And again, if you've been using your imagination or simply thinking rationally, wouldn't surprise you too much to th know that this is the inferior pancreatico-duodenal artery. And, likewise, anterior inferior pancreatico duodenal, posterior inferior pancreatico duodenal. Uh. What's important about this area is that we've got a section where the foregut blood supply from the celiac trunk meets the midgut blood supply from the superior mesenteric artery, and this is an area of anastomosis. And that can be very important if you have blockage of any of these vessels, that there's the ability for some transfer of blood between the two parent trunks at that site. To jump a little bit ahead, even further, another branch off the superior mesenteric goes to the transverse colon. And that is the blood supply known as the middle colic artery. And 
And the middle colic artery is where we're going to have anastomosis between the superior mesenteric and the next branch, the inferior mesenteric. And we'll see that in the next section. All right, now we finished with the celiac trunks. Now we're going to draw in the branches that go to the rest of the GI system, the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries. Now the superior mesenteric artery supplies the midgut. The midgut is basically the distal duodenum, the small intestine, which is the jejunum and the ileum, and a large part of the colon or the large intestine, specifically the cecum, the appendix, and the ascending colon and transverse colon. So right here we're going to draw in a little stylized jejunum, which is the first part of the small intestine after the duodenum, the ileum, which then terminates in the cecum, which is a pouch at the base of the ascending colon. Ascending colon is on the right side of the body and it meets the liver more or less at what's referred to as the hepatic flexure and that gives off the transverse colon which goes across the front of the abdomen, hangs on a mesentery, so it's actually in the abdominal cavity pretty substantially and then turns south also known as inferiorly to become the descending colon. Now it's important here is all of this up until this point is midgut, but as soon as we hit the descending colon and then the sigmoid colon and then finally the rectum, these parts are known as the hindgut. So hindgut more or less includes the descending sigmoid colon and the rectum and is going to have a different blood supply, the inferior mesenteric artery. So now we'll draw in the abdominal aorta and again it's posterior to all of this and it's going down, down, down through the abdomen and as we get close into the pelvis it splits into a right and left common iliac artery. We'll just draw those guys in here as the terminus of the abdominal aorta and we'll shade this in. All right, so here we've got once again the abdominal aorta, the jejunum, the ileum, the cecum, and we'll draw in the appendix here sticking off the base of the cecum, a little vermiform appendix, small little pretty much vestigial organ right there, and then the cecum Ascending, transverse, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and rectum are all colored in brown. Page and Dr. Freud with that color association. But right here, let's draw in the, the superior mesenteric artery. So superior mesenteric artery exits. We've got the celiac just above it here that we talked about briefly a moment ago. And the superior mesenteric artery branches. And it's going to supply blood to the jejunum and ileum. So we draw a branch here, and this is vastly simplified because the small intestine is very long and there's a lot of coils. One thing that is fairly accurate is that the jejunum is predominant on the left side of the abdominal cavity and the ileum is predominantly found on the right side of the abdominal cavity. And the blood supply to the small intestine is really pretty interesting because it forms vascular loops or arcades. that stretch between adjacent regions of the gut tube. And in the jejunum, you've got fairly long arcades and fairly long straight vessels, or vasa recta, that extend off of those to get to the jejunum itself. And no big surprise, these are referred to as jejunal arteries. We get to the ileum, and the arcades are much smaller, not as elongated, but they're also very multiple. There's a, or multiplied considerably. There's a lot of them stretching off the parent branch, the superior mesenteric, and then lots of short vasa recta reaching off of those to get to the ileum itself. And these are ileal arteries, both coming off of our parent branch right here, which is the superior mesenteric. 
Now the superior mesenteric also gives off a fairly substantial branch that heads towards the right side of the body wall, and its name gives us a pretty good indication of what it's doing. This is the iliocolic artery. And the iliocolic artery is going to travel down and give off a branch that goes to the ilium, hence the name, ties in with those other ileal arteries, and this branch heads down towards primarily the cecum, and that's going to be the cecal artery, and it generally has an anterior branch and a posterior branch. In addition to that, off the iliocolic we've got a vessel that travels down through the mesentery of the appendix to get to the actual appendix itself, and that is the appendicular artery. Good to find your iliocolic when you're looking for the appendix, when you're doing a removal of it, appendectomy, you need to make sure you get the blood supply and completely seal it off before you're done. Now after that, we have a branch that can come off either the superior mesenteric separately, or maybe branch off the iliocolic, but where it goes determines what it is. And where this one goes is to the ascending colon. And this is called the right colic artery. And it's supplying the ascending colon. And if you remember back to the last section, we mentioned a little branch that goes up to the transverse colon right here. And that is the middle colic artery. And just for completeness sake, we'll draw in the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery that was heading up towards the duodenum and the pancreas. There we go. Other branch off the superior mesenteric. And that's about it. Superior mesenteric supplies the midgut, jejunum, ileum, a little bit of the prox of the distal duodenum. And then the cecum, the appendix, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and right about here. At the splenic flexure on the left is where we have the transition. And the transition is to blood being supplied to this area by the inferior mesenteric artery. And it's supplying the hindgut. Hindgut, once again, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum. And here, it supplies the descending colon through what will not come as a surprise to you, branch that's known as the left colic artery. It supplies the sigmoid colon through branches that are known as sigmoidal arteries. The rectum has a fairly complex blood supply. The only part of it that's coming off the aorta directly is referred to as the superior mesenteric, sorry, the superior rectal artery. But there are rectal arteries that come off of other branches, particularly the iliacs, a little further down in the pelvis, and supply it a little bit differently. But the superior rectal is the only branch off the inferior mesenteric. And as you can see, we've got right colic for the ascending, middle colic for the transverse, and a left colic artery for the descending colon. Not surprisingly, there's a significant amount of anastomosis between these vessels. And one piece in particular that's important is located right here. This is referred to as the marginal artery, also known as the marginal artery of Drummond. And for those of you who were around in the 80s, what you talking about, Mr. Drummond? Well, he's talking about the marginal artery. What this allows to happen is for the inferior mesenteric and superior mesenteric arteries to anastomose 
and compression or obliteration of one may be survivable if the backflow from one of the other arteries can supply everything thereafter. All right, we've covered the blood supply to the digestive organs. Let's look at the venous drainage of the digestive tract. Now, we just finished off with the inferior mesenteric artery, which supplies the hindgut, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and rectum. And no big surprise, there's an inferior mesenteric vein that stretches off of that. But it does something a little bit odd. The spleen has a very substantial vein that joins with the inferior mesenteric vein. And the two of those travel together towards the right side of the body. Now the superior mesenteric artery supplied the midgut. And the superior mesenteric vein drains the midgut. But because your digestive tract wants to get all of the blood to the liver as much as it can <clears throat> so that the nutrients and other structures that you've digested can be detoxified. These veins do not drain to the inferior vena cava. Instead, they're taken to the liver through the portal vein. The portal vein <clears throat> is, by definition, what happens when the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein meet. Let's just make that a little clearer. Now, one question people have a lot is, why is the splenic vein involved here since it doesn't digest food? Fair enough. What it does do is digest old and damaged red blood cells. And the red blood cells, uh, the iron, the heme, and uh, bile precursors are released from it. So unconjugated bilirubin travels to the splenic vein to reach the liver where it will be conjugated and allowed to move into the bile to aid digestion of fats and then released into the intestine. So right here we've reached the point where the hepatic portal vein has come into existence and is heading towards the liver. And from the liver it goes into a wide ramification of capillaries that exposes hepatocytes to all of this blood. We've covered the hindgut and the midgut. The foregut's a little bit of a separate story. The splenic artery is part of the foregut, as is the spleen, but the left and right gastric veins drain directly to the portal vein. So we'll draw that in here. There's the right gastric vein. The gastromental veins also drain here. We won't color those in, but just be aware they also have to drain to the portal system. And the blood supply to the gallbladder comes from the cystic artery, and the cystic vein drains to the hepatic portal vein as well. And then from the liver, the blood is metabolized, drains to hepatic veins. Let's draw in the cartoon liver right there and travels then through these hepatic veins to the inferior vena cava, and from there da, 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 to the right atrium of the heart. Now, one important branch of the left gastric vein we're gonna talk about real quick here is that esophageal branch. The esophageal vein draining to the left gastric vein seems pretty nondescript. Where it becomes important is when we have portal hypertension. And in portal hypertension, due to damage to the liver, due to cirrhosis, viral infection, hepatitis, things of that nature, you wind up with blockage of the portal vein within the liver. And the blood is unable to get through to the liver as easily as it used to, and because it's getting like a filter that's got too much stuff stuck in it, and the blood backs up into the portal system. This is referred to as portal hypertension. Now at this point, that backed up blood follows the path of least resistance. It's a fluid. It doesn't have any desire to go anywhere other than where the uh, resistance is the least. You can have the blood back up into the hindgut and push into the veins that drain the anal region and the inferior rectal region. So you can travel through the inferior rectal 
veins to get into the caval system, and this is a potential cause of hemorrhoids in response to portal hypertension. You can also have small vessels along the colon that are close to the body wall and large to get to lumbar veins that drain to the caval system as well in response to portal hypertension. And on the front of the abdomen, you can actually have very small veins that stretch out from the liver along the falciform ligament that enlarge tremendously to get to the thoracoepigastric veins on the body wall. These are the big blue ones that you'll sometimes see on people's torso going along on uh, the mid axillary line up the right and the left. And this, interesting enough, has to travel through the umbilicus to get to the thoracoepigastric veins and is referred to as a caput medusa when you have these veins enlarged tremendously called the head of snakes or the head of medusa in response to portal hypertension. One of the most potentially damaging and lethal manifestations of portal hypertension though is enlargement of these esophageal veins as they drain to other esophageal veins that go into the azygous veins. And the reason these are clinically relevant is if you get significant blood flow through these esophageal veins, they're normally fairly small. And these veins, in response to portal hypertension, can balloon to be much larger than they typically are, and they become very thin-walled. And if the esophagus is irritated due to reflux or just the sheer size of these veins, they can tear and someone can actually exsanguinate or bleed out from their esophagus. Very unpleasant sight to see, but a very real manifestation of portal hypertension. All right, we finished off with the mesenteric vessels, the celiac trunk and the mesenteric veins leading to the hepatic portal vein. We're gonna finish off, I swear, with the other vessels of the posterior abdominal wall that are not related to the digestive tract per se. Let's take a look at some of the vessels of the abdomen that don't go to the gastrointestinal tract. So we've already gone through an extreme and perhaps maddening detail. The single branches that come off the abdominal aorta that go to the GI tract, foregut being the celiac with its three branches, the common hepatic, splenic, and the left gastric. And midgut getting its blood supply from the superior mesenteric artery. And the hindgut getting its blood supply from the inferior mesenteric artery. Now the paired branches that come off from the abdominal aorta tend to go to other structures. So the first one is way up high here and stretches out quite a ways. That's going to be the left and right inferior phrenic artery. Da, da, da. See if I can spell correctly. All right, inferior phrenic artery. And next up, two very big arteries going right and left. And 
these are the renal arteries going to the kidney. Only drawing one, but there are two, one on the other side as well. <clears throat> and then, branching between the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries, we've got two small but incredibly long arteries. And they're going to structures that originated up in the kind of mid-abdominal upper lumbar region, and then descended to a variable degree. These are the two gonadal arteries. And if you're a male, there's a testicular artery and descends all the way down to the scrotum. You lar. And if you're female, ovarian artery, hanging out on either side of the uterus, right along the line of the oviduct, releasing eggs into that area. All right, one other organ that we want to throw in here as well is the adrenal or suprarenal gland, which is hanging out here on top of the kidneys on its superior pole. And it's a little bit interesting in its blood supply because it gets blood from the inferior phrenic artery. It gets blood directly from the aorta, and it gets blood from the renal artery. So here we've got branches from all of these guys making their way to the suprarenal or adrenal gland, and quite sensibly they're named suprarenal arteries. And there's superior suprarenals off the inferior phrenic, there's middle suprarenals off the aorta itself, and there's inferior suprarenal arteries off the renal artery right there. Now that pretty much covers it. To be very complete, we can draw in some little lumbar segmental branches that are coming off of the aorta in this region, much like the intercostals came off in the thorax. These lumbar segmental vessels come off in the abdomen to supply the body wall and abdominal musculature. We are finally at the end, promise of the abdominal vasculature. We've talked about the portal vein, and now we're gonna talk about the inferior vena cava, the venous drainage from pretty much everything in the body below the waist. So the inferior vena cava is on the right side of the abdomen, just as the aorta tends to be on the left side of the abdomen. And they are roughly parallel looking structures. They kind of have the same appearance, big stout vessels that have, in this case, common iliac veins draining into the inferior vena cava. But there are some important differences. Now, first off, we've already discussed how the hepatic veins drain the liver, and the liver received all the blood from the foregut, the midgut, the hindgut, and the spleen, and all those associated vessels. So the hepatic veins, two or three, drain into the inferior vena cava, very, very high near the top of the abdomen. So let's just draw those guys out right here. These are the hepatic veins draining into the inferior vena cava, or cava, should you wish. Right here, let's take a look at the paired veins that we saw earlier. Now the two big players here, as we discuss, are going to be the right and left renal veins. So let's shave these guys in. And when it comes to the inferior vena cava, right and left make a big difference. Because remember, the inferior vena cava tends to be primarily on the right side of the abdomen. And that has implications for the venous drainage. So we'll be citing everything as we go through here. So right renal vein, left renal vein. And on the right, the vessel is primarily on the right, so 
Those veins that we talked about earlier, the paired ones, tend to drain straight to the inferior vena cava. Here's the gonadal vein on the right. So right gonadal vein. The suprarenal gland sends its blood through a fairly stout vein, single vein, back to the inferior vena cava on the right side. So that is the right suprarenal or adrenal vein. And we have our inferior phrenic vein draining the blood from the underside of the diaphragm back to the inferior vena cava, still in the abdomen. Just finish shading that in here. All right, right. Inferior phrenic vein. So, right side, everything's easy. It all goes into the inferior vena cava. Left side's also easy, although it's different. Your inferior phrenic vein on the left has to go across the aorta, and instead of doing that, it takes an easier path, and it dumps into the left renal vein. So right here, left inferior phrenic does not go to the vena cava directly. Instead, it passes into the left renal vein, which then gets to the inferior vena cava. And, not too shockingly, same thing happens with the suprarenal vein, which sometimes may join with the inferior phrenic vein before dumping into the left renal vein, but we'll treat them as separate right now. Left suprarenal vein to the left renal vein, and no big shock here, same pattern holds true for the gonadal vein. So the left gonadal vein takes a more tortuous path. Instead of having its blood go uninterruptedly into the inferior vena cava, it has to come here to this sharp angle, turn, turn, to get into the main blood flow. And that, for you guys out there, is one reason that your left testicle tends to hang a little lower in the scrotum than the right, because there's more blood stasis on that side. And for you ladies, if you've noticed your left ovary hanging low, I would ask you how the heck you know that. But that's basically the drainage. On, things, on the left, things drain to the left renal vein before the IVC. On the right, directly to the inferior vena cava. And last, and probably least, blood drainage from the body wall itself through those lumbar segmental veins just drains directly to the inferior vena cava on the right and the left. That takes care of the abdominal blood supply. And thank you very much for your attention.